Welcome to the Religica podcast at the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University, where we explore core themes around the values that shape our lives each day. This is Michael Reed Trice, director and professor at the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Amir Hussein, who is chair and professor of theological studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where he teaches courses on religion. His own particular specialty is the study of Islam, focusing on contemporary Muslim societies in North America. He is also the president of the American Academy of Religion, and this brings us to the conversation today. This year, a state college, New College, in Sarasota, Florida, came under the microscope of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who has an eye on becoming the next president of the United States and who has a plan to transform New College, which is known as progressive and describes itself as a community of free thinkers. On January 31st of 2023, New College's president, Patricia Ocker, was ousted, and Governor DeSantis unveiled his higher education policies to further weaken faculty tenure protections, eliminate diversity and equity programs, and mandate Western civilization courses, according to the New York Times. In response, on February 9th, the reputable American Council of Learned Societies released a statement that, to our mind, drew a line in the sand, noting New College as another glaring example of an attack on the principles of academic freedom and faculty governance. The claim by Florida administration of, quote-unquote, indoctrination and the changes to come at New College at the hands of the state invite a conversation about the role of the university and the shared responsibility to protect critical thinking, freedom of speech, an informed debate. We invite you to take a listen. My name is Amir Hussein. I am chair and professor of the Department of Theological Studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, which, as you know from Seattle, is a Jesuit university here in Los Angeles. And I'm also this year currently the president of the American Academy of Religion. And how long is the tenure, just for the audience's sake? You know, this, is a, this audience has a general curiosity and concern around the role of religion in but a more general audience. How long is your tenure there at, uh, as president? So as president, it's one year. The AAR does a really nice thing where you are elected into the presidential line, but that means you come in as the vice president. So you serve a year as vice president, then you serve a year as president-elect, then you serve a year as president. So the presidential year itself is one year, but before that, you've served two years in the presidential line as vice president, president-elect. When you're vice president, you serve on the program committee. When you're president-elect, you serve on the finance committee. So you get a sense of programming, finances. So it's a really nice thing. You're not just brought in for one year and then out the next year. I was fortunate that I was actually on the board of directors the year before. So this is technically my fourth year on the board of directors, my first and only year as president. I see. And then in terms of your tenure at Loyola Marymount, you're the chair of the theology department. How many years have you been on the faculty there? So I've been here since 2005, and and there's a tie-in I can make, you know, when we start talking about things having to do with Florida, with what I did at Cal State Northridge and the chancellor there who'd come from Florida, so there's there's some interesting tie-ins there. But um, I came to to Loyola Marymount in 2005, and it was funny, you know, being at this Catholic Jesuit school as a Muslim. I was the first non-Christian who was tenured in the department. I think that was 2009, and then I became chair in 2020. Was that recognized in 2009? Was that recognized as a historic watershed or landmark by the university? Was that something significant for the university? Yeah, it, 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 not in any sort of formal major way, but I think just sort of recognizing this. And, and LMU, I'd want to talk so much about LMU, marvelous, marvelous place. And, and, and one of the things, and you know this as being at a fellow Jesuit school, mm-hmm. is the Jesuit commitment to excellence in education meant that in a much more dramatic way, our last Jesuit president was Father Bob Lawton. Mm-hmm. And our charter was that the president had to be a Jesuit. Now, a lot of Jesuit schools you know, have gone to lay a Catholic presence because there aren't enough Jesuits in there. Mm-hmm. Our provost that year, who was basically acting president when Father Lawton stepped down, was Dave Bircham, who had been dean of our law school. And you had 90% of the faculty say, hey, we want this guy to be our next president. Now, you won't get 90% of the faculty saying, it's a nice day outside. <laughs> you know, it, It's too windy, it's too cold, it's, it's too sunny. When you have that kind of agreement from faculty who tend not to agree on, on fairly simple things, it was astonishing. It's like problem, Dave Bertram is not Catholic, he's Protestant. And so the trustees, to their credit, changed our charter to say that the president, A, did not have to be a Jesuit priest, B, did not have to be Catholic. So we were, in fact, the first Jesuit school to have a non-Catholic 
president. I think that just speaks to this place and why I love being here. And, and I think you, you can do that in Los Angeles, mm. where you've got such a huge Catholic presence. I mean, there, there's no fear about the Catholic tradition going away. It's literally the largest tradition in the area. Is there something you know to the Jesuit sensibility, just a moment on this, you know, with 27 Jesuit colleges and universities in the country alone, this is a concern. I imagine it's shared for other religiously based colleges and universities. In this case, where you have what's called a kind of Jesuit charism, where you don't have a Jesuit president, say someone who isn't a part of the clergy, you don't have a Catholic in that place, but you have a faculty across different religious and philosophical persuasions and perspectives. What is it from the LMU perspective as we're speaking to this, that the faculty would say, even aligned to all of that, this is still our core Ignatian or Jesuit sensibility of ourselves that transcends any particular president in their religious affiliation. And I, th I think that that's it. The mission of the university is what attracted me mm -hmm. as someone who's not a Catholic or someone who's not a Christian. And I can say more about that in the answer to the question because it ties in with the CSU and where I'd come from before. But to come to a place where education and the education of the whole person was important, that it's not just, and I'm here, I'm pointing to my head, it's not just the intellect, hmm. it's the body, it's the affect. The Jesuits were famous for educating through theater, through hmm. art, through music. I begin my classes oftentimes with songs because it, that hits the students in a very different kind of way than if I put an intellectual proposition on the board. Hmm. And so I think for us, and, and, and we're sort of unique in that of the 27 Jesuit schools, we're the only one that's Jesuit and Marymount and the Sisters of St. Joseph. So we have sort of three charisms. We have the Jesuits, we have the Marymount Sisters, the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, hmm. and the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. And, and both of those orders, with the Marymount Sisters in particular, to make God known and hmm. loved. How do you understand this? And it doesn't mean to make God known from a Catholic point of view or a Christian point of view. I think that's the really crucial part here. And the fact that as a person of faith, as a Muslim, I'm welcomed here in my full self. You don't have to sort of check your religious self at the door in a way that we wouldn't expect you to check your sexual identity or your race, or your ethnicity or whatever. Sometimes in the state systems, you run into those issues of, yeah. We can't deal with the normative, the theological, the confessional. We got to put that aside. It's like, no, mm -hmm. that's us. That's who we are, especially in a place like Los Angeles. I mean, you, you have the same thing in Seattle, just on mm -hmm. a different scale, where it's such a diverse space where you've got Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, Jews, atheists. And you either say, hey, we're going to welcome all these people to the table or we're going to shut them out. I mean, there are schools where I could not teach, even though I'm, you know, chair of the theology department, president of the American Academy of Religion, mm -hmm. because I'm not a Christian and I couldn't sign a faith statement. Well, and, and this brings us really to how we understand the expression of a religious freedom, educational freedom, and to our topic today. And, and one of the reasons that, first of all, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. I know you're very busy, but one of the things we, we really wanted to center on and, and discuss was the conversation around a statement that came out on February 9th from the American Council of Learned Societies. In their self-description, they uh, note supporting the creation and circulation of knowledge that advances the understanding of humanity and human endeavors in the past, present, and future. And it goes on from there. And the American Academy of Religion, of which you are the president, as you stated, has this historic relationship also with the ACLS. And a statement of this kind, I just want to place in front of you and to the audience, should ring the conscience of the American public we're suggesting as a premise for our conversation for a number of reasons around, in particular, New College in Florida and the events happening there. I've described that a bit in the introduction, but I think it's important for the listener to have a sense from you of what's at stake. What are the specific tones, do you think, that the public should be hearing in this statement, which we will be providing with this podcast at this time? What's at stake in terms of, of course, the AAR has signed on to this statement, and what's at stake with the ACLS statement itself? I think what's at stake, and I don't mean to be too dramatic, is really the future of higher education okay. you know, in this country, which which is so important. I don't mean to speak about my own experiences, but let me do that for Please a minute. Do, you know, yeah. I'm what we call first to go, the first kid in the family to go to university. Both my parents had high school educations. Both my parents worked in factories. If you'd asked me in high school, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have said a, a doctor because that was like the smartest thing you could think of. And mm -hmm. as an immigrant kid who was born in Pakistan, grew up in Canada, you know, your parents want to push you to success and that that's one of them. Mm -hmm. So you're smart kids, so you go to university and that's where you get the sense of, wait, there's this thing called the intellectual life, like that you can get paid to read and write, to think 
intellectual as a job? How do I get that job? And then you see the massive transformation of people who get university educations and how that affects not just them, but their families. You know, the fact that I'm a professor, my sister's an engineer, has economic benefits, not just for my family, my sister's family, but for my parents, for lots of folks around us. And so I, I think higher education is so important, and particularly a state-funded higher education. You know, I, I grew up in Canada. Almost all the universities, except for a handful, are public universities. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're run with primarily funding through the state. They've had to change that understanding of where I went to the University of Toronto, this idea that the state isn't going to provide 80% of the budget in the way that it used to in the 60s and 70s. Now the state may provide 20% of the budget. How do you then come up with the rest of the money to run this, especially if you're a big research school with expensive, you know, medical schools or engineering programs, mm-hmm. you know, that, that require literally hundreds of millions of dollars. So well, all this to say that this is crucial. You know, when you're mm-hmm. talking about higher education. The American Council of Learned Societies is an organization of, I believe, like 79 member societies from different humanities, social sciences, disciplines. The the American Academy of Religion joined them, I want to say, in 1979 Mm -hmm. or so. And so for our members, meaning the American Academy of Religion, it's about the academic study of, of religion and promoting that. And so... We will take positions, and we're not a social service organization, we're not a social justice organization, and so it's not that, oh, here's this position, who would be against hunger, who would be against brutality or whatever, we should sign on to those kinds of statements. For us, it's about our members really are in the study of religion, so where does this intersect particularly with the study of religion? And the statement the ACLS put out, I think was really powerful because it talks about ways in which there's an interference with that from in this case, states, the in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, what we want is a free inquiry. I think that's the hallmark mm-hmm. of the university where you're welcome to discuss things. You bring in all perspectives. As I say, and, and we'll talk more about this, indoctrination is an easy thing to do. Most of us don't do that. Education is the hard thing. You know, how do you mm-hmm. create educated citizens? That's difficult. How do you give them different perspectives, different views? That's what we should be doing. And I think we are doing mm-hmm. you know, in, in the university setting. The danger comes when we say, oh, we're only going to fund this thing. Or we're only going to fund this kind of thought. If it's only going to be left or right. I mean, years ago, John Stewart of The Daily Show was talking about why do we approach things as if it's from the left and the right? Like cartoon characters have up and down. Like there's more than just left and right, you know, mm-hmm. in, in terms of analysis. So, so I think the long answer to your question here, I, I think it's absolutely crucial what's happening with respect to higher education, with respect to the funding of higher education, because so much of it and so many of us depend on public education. You know, I, I'm a product literally from kindergarten to PhD of public education. Now I happen to teach in a private school, but that's a much later kind of development. That This is crucial. Well, and to your first point as well, I so appreciate what you're saying to the very first point as well, the life of free inquiry, the life of the mind, where the uncoerced uh, appreciation of the idea by which one is able to creatively and thoughtfully consider multiple views and opinions at once. Many of the students at New College were also interviewed around this claim that they were being indoctrinated. And of course, their position was contrary to that. So no, we're actually receiving a number of perspectives and in fact felt that there was a more moderated approach, neither conservative or certainly um, more liberal in that case What are we to make of an example like this of a public small liberal arts college such as New College where we see this, where we live in a country that is peppered with liberal arts colleges all across the landscape of the continental United States, many of them with religion departments, thinking of the American Academy of Religion. But in this case, where we have a student body like others under 700 that renders it financially and otherwise vulnerable to a state that may exercise its political will to test a growing national precedent, in particular this time with the governor, Governor DeSantis, who has aspirations to become the next president of the United States, and has certainly turned his view toward education, public education, critically. I mentioned that. You know, what messages are sent as you're considering this answer to politicians or administrators in other states who will find methods of inquiry within the liberal arts objectionable, say, to right-leaning political agendas? There's just so much to ask here. In short, what are these colleges caught up in? in the crosswinds of a political agenda, and what are we to make of that and to do about it? And there's so much there, and there's unfortunately such a rich history there connecting with Florida. Let me just give you that, that example from my Please. own uh, yeah. world. 
I came to California in 1997 after I'd done my, my PhD at the University of Toronto to teach at California State University Northridge, the Cal State University system. And that was 1997. 1998, Charlie Reed was appointed as the new chancellor. Now, he's an interesting guy, and, and I want to talk about him for a second because Please, I think yeah. directly on mm-hmm. what happens here. Charlie Reed was a guy who had gone to school, had a doctorate in education, but worked for the then governor of Florida. He was the chief of staff of that governor, I believe, in 1984. I think in 1985, he gets appointed to head the state university system of Florida. And that was an interesting moment of, wait, yes, this person has a doctorate in education, but they're really not an academic, they're really not doing these kinds of things. They're really working in the government. He was, and unfortunately passed away in 2016, he was the chief of staff to the Florida's governor, who then appoints him as head of the Florida State University system as its chancellor. Interesting. He then came to California in 1998 and took over the California State University system. And so this moment of political appointees mm-hmm. is not a new thing who are running universities. And at some level, you can say, well, that's as it should be. If the state, meaning in in, in this case of the state of Florida or here where I am in California, the state of California is funding these institutions to literally billions of dollars, the California State University System, the University of California System is the largest university system out there. Should they have some level of, of control? And you want to say, yes, but because it's not it's not about for all the different political views, this country really is that bimodal. It's either Democrat or Republican. You know, very rarely are you independent or Green Party or you know, something else there. And so when there's a Republican governor in California, should Republican ideas be pushed forward the university? When there's a Democrat governor, should there be, Dem- you know, no, it should be independent of whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. It really should be about what's best for California. And, and I think the danger, and now taking it back to New College in yeah. Florida, is that I, I think very much so for Governor DeSantis, who very much is about making statements that may be quite problematic. And I, and I say this as someone who, who is not a, a Catholic, but teaches in a Jesuit university. When you move migrants across the country, as a way of drawing attention to what you see as a failed immigration policy. And you're literally disrupting the lives of people. And you can argue or trafficking those people are being at best disingenuous with these people. But at worst, you're treating people as objects. And, and that's the real problem that, you know, for those of us who work in the humanities, we don't deal with chemicals in a test tube. You know, the chemist can say that, yeah, I can be subjective. My work is these chemicals, this reaction that takes place in this environment. Mm-hmm. As somebody who works in the human sciences, the humanities, my work is with people. And you have to treat people with a basic dignity. You have to treat people with basic respect. That's just who we are as, as human beings, Precisely. whether we believe we're children of God or not. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, that that's the gear. So, so I think what, what you're seeing here very much is a political statement say hey look we're going to do this and precisely we can do this here at this small place because this isn't the state university system of florida this isn't ucla Mm -hmm. this isn't something with hundreds of millions of dollars or a billion dollar budget here and you are dependent on the state for funding so we're not going to give you the funding unless you do what we say and in fact, we can change around the people that are there. Mm-hmm. That's incredibly problematic because what it means is you're really bowing to the whims of the day, the government of the day, mm-hmm. rather than things that, that are meant to be much longer. That new college, top of the name, you know, relatively new within the state there. But in that tradition of small liberal arts colleges that often are private, mm-hmm. where people like me or my parents couldn't afford to send me to a private liberal arts college, they could send you to a public institution. And so this is, you know, this really interesting way of having this small liberal arts college experience in a public, meaning publicly funded setting there. And so you you can make those changes with a student body of 700 that are much harder to make with a student body of 70,000. It's interesting. I mean, to your point, so the listener knows, as we've noted earlier in the introduction, the college president has been replaced. The board of trustees has been shuffled and replaced. And the decisions that have been made and that are predicted to be made in the next 120 days will be significant on the curriculum and on the teaching philosophy for the school going forward. To another point you've made, there's a large segment of the student body that are first generation 
for the very reasons you just identified, they are in a good liberal arts college. It's a public school. It costs less. It's their baby first generation coming through. So they're very aware of where they are in their family system and of the capacity or the possibility that they have in front of them now. A large quarter of that population also are from the LGBTQIA plus community. There's a lot at stake for this student body and for the teaching philosophy and methodologies that would be coming down from a state that has already come out and spoken very openly about its positionality on gender, on how it understands particular readings on history, and particularly on American history, on what can be identified actually in the curriculum when speaking about history of racism in the United States. So for instance, as a professor, I may not be able to talk about Jim Crow laws, but I can talk about the history of Nazism because I'm not able to dismiss the Holocaust. So I will be able to talk generally about genocide, but I won't be able to talk about how the Third Reich actually intentionally used some of the Jim Crow philosophy because I can't mention the Jim Crow philosophy that's complicated at a curricular level. In other words, these kinds of obstructions at the curricular level become increasingly problematic for the free exchange of ideas. Yeah. No, I, I, absolutely. And I think part of it too is what's the purpose of this education? And so the part of the piece I, I didn't mention when I talked about Charlie Reed as the chancellor coming in, he very publicly declared when he came in, I can't remember if it was 98 or 99, he came in in 98 as the chancellor. So it may have been 1999. He said he saw, and it's funny what you remember from over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but he saw the purpose of the California State University system, and I quote, as creating educated workers for the California workforce. Hmm. And I thought, huh, I thought I was trying to create educated citizens for the world, not workers for California. The, that in a funny way is probably what set me off in, yeah. in terms of looking to say, oh, is there a place that actually creates educated citizens for the world and not just simply workers for California? And, and don't get me wrong, as I mentioned, somebody who came from a working class background, of course, I want students to have job skills. I want students to be able to get a job sure. when they graduate from university and get a good job to help their families, all the economics I was talking about. But my job primarily is not vocational. My job is not to train you to be an accountant. There's nothing wrong with that. Folks in our accounting department do that. And my job is to help you, you know, read, write, think, critically understand things. So you could be an accountant or a teacher or an investment banker or a doctor or a mm. homemaker or whatever, whatever, whatever. And so again, that appeal for me of the Jesuit education, where we are in fact trying to create educated citizens for the world and for these students who want to get this skill set. And you think about in this funny kind of neoliberal way, like are we creating this sort of two-tiered system mm. where one group of people get shifted off into these places where they're given technical skills so they can become like, you know, workers or best managers. Another group of people, where are the wealthy sending their kids? Well, they're sending them to the small private liberal arts colleges so they can read, they can write, they can learn a foreign language, they can go abroad for their junior year so that when they take over, you know, mommy and daddy's company, right. they actually have some wisdom and some intellect and some global perspective and things like that. But then you want to say, oh, yeah, but for other people's kids, we just want them, you know, the basics, math and writing, and then you can be a good manager. Well, yeah, you can be a good manager, but what about owning the company? What about mm. starting a brand new company that's what you know and you can you can hear in my voice you know the yeah, excitement yeah. here that's what gives me joy that's that excitement of being able to educate people who can literally in you know in the jesuit system we talk about creating men and women for others yeah but also talk about transformational education like transforming the world setting the world on fire that yeah. that's the kind of things that, that we want to be able to do. And I think very carefully using the, the new college Florida, completely opposite of that. Let's dismantle this. Let's cut this down. Hmm. Let's put education in this. And you sort of can't see what I'm doing with my hands, but it's these hmm. little boxes, smaller and smaller and smaller boxes. Let's look at this and not look at that. And, and as someone, you know, who became a naturalized citizen, born in Pakistan, grew up in Canada, mm -hmm. and having I lived here for, for a while, you realize, okay, this is probably where I'm going to be. This is probably where I want to see myself retiring. So I became a naturalized citizen 10 years ago and taking the citizenship test, learning about the history. Mm -hmm. It's not a wonderful history, but no country mm -hmm. has a wonderful history. You know, in, in Canada, we're just struggling now with issues around Indigenous First Nations peoples, mm -hmm. how the country came to be. And those are very real kinds of questions. And, and you have to grapple with that in order to address it. The example you gave 
was a fascinating one with the Nazis. And you think about how is it that in Germany, now, again, it was after World War II, and it was because we, me and the U.S., were forced to do it. But this eradication of that Nazi ideology, uh-huh. you know, we made them do it. We made them strip the language. We made them strip the clothing. Uh-huh. We made them take the kids uh-huh. of the concentration camps uh-huh. and show them the death chambers. Uh-huh. We don't do that with slavery. We don't take kids to plantations. We don't take kids to and show them the auction. No. And now we're saying we can't even talk about that. You know, how do we talk about the history of our country well, without talking about the history of our country? Well, this is probably to your point here. I think this is what a, an education that values a kind of free thought that really interrogates even the suppositions, the things that we think we hold true, enables us to see how cruelty hides within systems. It allows us to interrogate the truths that we hold dear that maybe are actually, they're parading as truths, but they could be incredibly oppressive in other ways. That's not the politics of blame or shaming, right? That's just going to what you said earlier. It's about looking at the history itself. But to your earlier point about creating citizens for the world, informed people who can look at history, understand history, and also shape that historical consciousness toward a future that serves our shared or common humanity. That's one way. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we both teach at Jesuit universities. I'm here at Seattle University. Our strategic plan now calls for this whole strategic emphasis on the whole person and service to the world. The other perspective that we're hearing, and I want to ask you about that, the current national claim and the claim on New College identified in the statement for the ACLS of a liberal indoctrination in higher education. We hear this often right, across the, the national landscape. It takes issue with the public virtues of free speech and critical thinking and informed debate. When legislators wholesale, wherever they may be, or governors claim that a way of educating a whole methodology is in fact indoctrinating, then as the ACLS statement reads, it reads, quote, that this is what is threatened at this moment. I want to slow down so the listener understands that hearing from Professor Hussein, from your perspective, what is the threat and how does the listener see this already growing in our context and, and how deep is that threat? What's our concern? In some ways, this is revisiting something you said before, but I want to make sure we see this clearly in higher education today. Yeah. And, 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 and it's funny because I actually have that statement open in front of me. And so it's that line that I think is so important. We believe, and I'm reading now from the ACLS statement, mm-hmm. we believe that higher education is based on critical thinking and informed debate. We recognize that differences of opinion are vital to academic inquiry, and we support the rights of all students and faculty to freely engage in scholarly conversation and civil debate. I think that's precisely, I mean, the statement as you read, this is precisely what is starting in this moment. I think this is precisely what we're supposed to do here in the university. Part of it, that's civil debate. I am, I believe, the only human being in the world who has never owned a cell phone. And so that's a whole other story to get into for a whole other topic. But because I've never owned a cell phone, because I don't have any social media presence, I think I'm genuinely and genuinely happy because I'm not checking my Twitter feed or my Instagram account or things like that. I envy what you. I hear from folks is that this, I meaning the university is one of the few places where you can have these kinds of civil debates because it becomes so rancorous. It becomes so ideological. And that's one of the things, you know, when we talk about teaching our students about academic inquiry, about scholarly research, about a good, good sources, information literacy to use, you know, a different kind of term. That doesn't just simply mean, you know, how do you distinguish a, a scholarly source from a more popular source, you know, just because you find it on the web or just because you find a book doesn't make it so, you know, can you investigate it, what, what happens? But it also means, can you investigate different approaches? And so, Use an example of, of a person who does teach in the California system, Khalid Abu Fadl, is one of the great sort of scholars of Islamic law in this country. He teaches it at UCLA. And he begins his classes with a picture of himself with his library behind him. And he's got sort of a personal library of about 50,000 books. You know, he, he doesn't do this to show off. He doesn't say, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm an academic. Hey, look at me. I have 50,000 books. Hey, I read these 50,000 books. What he does is say, look, I own 50,000 books on Islamic law. How many books do you think there are on Islamic law if I have 50,000 of them? So this idea that oh, Islamic law is one thing, one book, I'll often tell my students, the most dangerous mm-hmm. person isn't the person that's read no books. It's the person that's read one book and think that they are now an expert in whatever. And so this goes back to what I was talking about with free inquiry and information literacy. 
I tell my students all the time, you can write a paper in my class saying whatever you want. You can write a paper saying Islam is the greatest religion in the world and everyone, especially women, should become Muslims because this will liberate them. You can write a paper saying Islam is the worst religion in the world and why would anyone, especially a woman, want to be a Muslim? I don't really care what point you take. What I care about is if you're writing the paper that says Islam is great, have you read things that say it isn't? Hmm. If you're writing the paper that says Islam is awful, have you read things that say maybe it's not? Hmm. You know, It's easy to prove our sources, and this is what I want to leave our listeners with. It's easy to find a book that proves your thesis. That's not scholarship. That's not difficult. That's high school. Go to the library, find a book that talks about what you want to understand. College-level thinking for me in a very crude way is go and find the book that says something that you think about, but then go and find the book that says the opposite. Read the two. Put them in dialogue with each other. Be able to make your argument about why Islam is the greatest religion while understanding that here are some people who think it's a terrible religion and here's why. And mm. what are your counterarguments to that? So I think that's really, for us in the humanities, what we try to do. And that's the hard part. Like, I wish I did indoctrination because that's easy. Indoctrinating my students is very simple. Read this book. Don't question what I tell you. You will get an A if you agree with me and an F if you fail. Like My job as a teacher would be much easier. <laughs> my grading of papers would be much easier there. <laughs> but I would be doing a terrible disservice, I mean, to myself and to my students. And so I, th I think for many of us, this idea that we're somehow indoctrinating our students is exactly the opposite of what we're doing. We're not, like, as I said before, indoctrination is easy. Education is hard. Yeah. Having them to think, having them to think critically, having them find the sources and not just the sources of proof. And then it goes back to civil debate, scholarly conversation, mm -hmm. because a part of the problem is, and, and what I hear from folks on social media is you're in these channels where you only get things that confirm what you already believe. Right. And you don't look at things like, are you the sort of person who's a Democrat who watches the election returns on the conservative, the Republican station? Are you the Republican who watches the returns on MSNBC just to get a sense of, hey, how's the other side <laughs> playing this? You know, and I think just even those kinds of, of things where we get our information from the sources that reinforce the positions that we already have, <laughs> that becomes quite problematic. <laughs> to this point of what I hear you saying about the virtues of education and the virtues of literacy and of public literacy and how really anemic, brittle a society becomes without it. And in fact, that we not only do ourselves a disservice in the present, but it's dangerous to our future because we lose our perspective of both our history and of the formation of our present. The critique, if I can ask, of the liberal agenda, we often hear that kind of phraseology that's out there. And maybe that's also what happens, kind of balkanization now, certainly in the United States, we see this in other countries right now around the world. But this, this tendency to want to create a kind of us-them or a polaritous relationship between things, it does something to this vision of the more global citizenry that's open to one another, that's engaging in the debate, that's ready for the conversation. What's your hope that we can actually have a healthier commons, a healthier kind of debate, given these kinds of moves at, say, at New College or or do you think this is kind of just a, the, the restive moment and that we have a tendency to correct or to right ourselves? That's a lot to ask in one question, but I'd like yeah. to hear your thoughts just no, generally. It, it is a lot. I, I think yeah. there's a couple of things there. You know, one is I'm confident in the institutions. I'm confident in the schools. And one of the nice things about studying history is you know that there are these changes here. It, it's not static. It's not dynamic to say the Catholic Church believes believe this. Well, when? Mm -hmm. For which Catholics? That kind of thing. So, so those totalitizing claims become sort of mm -hmm. problematic here. So I think absolutely things will sort of correct themselves, but, but it takes work. It needs work. It needs people to stand up. You can't just simply say, oh, let's not worry about this. Let's not worry about this. Oh, this is no big deal. This is no big deal. In the same way, and you don't mean to use that analogy, but you just think of like the physical institution, like the physical building, like, you know, you have a building, you have a house, and there's a little bit of mold, a little bit of termites. Mm -hmm. You can't say, oh, yeah, we'll just leave it, just leave it, just leave it, because 10 years later, the house falls down. And that becomes really problematic. So I think that the key is how do we create educated citizens with the full range of rights, responsibilities, thoughts that they can have? You know, the danger becomes that we support our own and our own becomes so much narrower and narrower and narrower. I mean, then that's one of the great things for me about America. I, I talked about, about, you know, 10 years ago becoming a naturalized citizen <laughs> and this idea that it's the constitution. Being an American is not an allegiance to a king. It's not an allegiance to like a physical 
land. It's allegiance to a piece of paper, mm-hmm. this document that says, here are our founding foundational sort of principles. And, and as someone you know, who grew up in Canada, very nice liberal place, you know, says, hey, there's something here. There's something here about these ideas, including the freedoms, mm-hmm. you know, including those kinds of things. And the danger becomes when we say, and I use the analogy of, of a sports team, when we say, oh, it's only my team. And I'm not going to be nice to the other team. I'm not even going to give them the nice facilities. Or I'm going to be rude to their fans. I mean, I'm like, wait, you, you can't do this. I mean, you can certainly support your own team, but that doesn't mean you shut out the other team. And so the danger is that, you know, you're sort of making this in your image. And that's the problem with education by definition is meant ah. to be long term. Institutions by definition are meant to be long term. It's not just here for a year or two years or three years. The founding fathers didn't intend a, an America that they thought would last for three years. And after that, we're done and we can maybe move on and do something else. So this is for a much longer time period. And so how do you keep this place going, knowing that, and you know, I don't know Florida politics, there might be down the road a democratic governor. There might be down the road someone who values, you know, these kinds of things who mm-hmm. says, no, no, let's do this. And as I say all the time, education is cheap. We talk about the money that we put mm-hmm. in, but we get so much money back. Like the, the Cal State system that, that I mentioned mm-hmm. where I first came from, I, I haven't read the latest stats, but when I left in 2005, they always did an economic impact of just Cal State Northridge. And pretty much like for every dollar the state gave, they got back in return between five and six dollars. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's, it's just, it's a good investment to spend this amount of money to educate a person who will then make that much more money, pay that much more in taxes, be that much more productive, maybe create their own business. And I think that's something that, that's, that's really good. That's something that's really healthy. You know, the, the, the spending, you hear these numbers and they sound like they're huge numbers that, you know, LA USD, the school district has like an $8 billion budget and that's a huge sort of mm-hmm. budget. But what are we spending on defense? What are we spending on this? You know, like, like it's a tiny amount compared right. to that. And so, so I, th- I think that moment of being able to say it, and then this is where the ACLS statement, this is why the AAR very gladly signed on to that statement mm-hmm. to say, no, this affects us. This affects our members with respect to the free inquiry about religion. If you're sort of limiting it to one or two foci, if you say Christianity means evangelical Christianity, the way in which it's practiced among mega churches in Florida, or for that matter, among a certain segment of Catholics, Governor DeSantis self identifies as a Catholic. That doesn't sort of connect with some of the diversity that I know mm-hmm. within the Catholic yeah. tradition. And you're presenting. It's the same thing. If you, are you presenting a face of the Catholic tradition as the only face yeah. and shutting that out? Like I, in a very different way, my presidential address this year. So one of the things you do as president of the American Catholic religion is at the annual meeting, which happens in November, the, the president gives a address. I've chosen to title that address in Spanish. I'm, I'm, my Spanish isn't good enough to give the address in Spanish, <laughs> but the title will be La Labor de Nuestras Manos, like literally the work of our hands. And I'm interested in two things. What is the work of our hands? When we do the study of religion, what is it that we're doing and how is it that we're doing it? But I put it in the Spanish because that's the dominant culture. I I live in Los Angeles. I've lived here for 25 years. Spanish is the dominant language. I teach in a Catholic university. Spanish is the language of the Catholic church. Whether we're talking about Puerto Ricans in New York or or, or Mexicans or, or Cubans in Florida or here in Los Angeles, it's Spanish. It's so true. I was raised in, in New Mexico, and until I was eight years old, I thought that all Catholics spoke Spanish. I thought that was the primary uh, language of the of the religion itself. But I, to what you've also said about the hands with regard to the title, the hands of the church, the hands of the religion, the hands of the American Academy of Religion, for the listener who doesn't have a lot of ready access to the AAR, I'd like to give you an opportunity as we're closing out to say a little more about the American Academy of Religion. It's committed to enhancing the public understanding of religion, of the values that shape public life today and the virtues that are sinewed within or across the many religious streams and philosophical pathways of its membership. What we know about the AAR, its importance to sign on to statements like this, clearly protecting the freedom for thought and speech. But we see this, don't we, every day in our temples and mosques, churches, synagogues, and more. What is the role, do you think, of the commitment to these core values and virtues for a healthy society uh, today. And, and what do you see in your presidency as the central role of the American Academy of Religion in the next one, two, three years to come? Yeah. And so our executive director, Alice Hunt, always does a great job when we start meeting. She just puts up the mission statement. Huh. So I think that's crucial for organizations to keep reminding ourselves, like, why are we here? Why is Loyola Marymount University here? Why is Yale University here? Why is the American Academy of Religion here? Our mission 
very simple, to foster excellence in the academic study of religion and enhance the public understanding of religion. So we're a scholarly society dedicated to the academic study of religion. We have, I don't know the exact numbers, slightly over 5,000 members, many of whom are tenure, tenure track of folks in universities, some of whom are contingent faculty in universities, some of whom are in gen colleges, some of whom are students, of a very small percentage who are sort of retired emeritus there. But if you look at religion, and let me just say a word just before that, if you look at religion in this country, it's really fascinating. We're a deeply religious country in a way the numbers have declined. But if you still ask, you know, at least 70% of Americans will say they believe in God, believe in some kind of higher mm. power. Very different from, let's say, the European context where like the Dutch, I think the majority of the Dutch are atheists. You know, mm. so to be a religious person in the Netherlands is to be the minority. To be a religious person in America is to be in the majority here. But with all the different religious traditions that are here, we study religion. And that sometimes happens in university religion departments or colleges departments, but only about 20% of U.S. colleges have a religion department. Sometimes it may be a philosophy department, sometimes it may be a humanities department. Sometimes it may not be, and this is our public understanding part, what do you do if you're a junior college, you know, it doesn't have a religion department, but you're training students who might want to go into a, a school of ed, you know, don't they need to learn about world religions as part of the curriculum? Like here in California, world religions is, you know, we do California missions in, in fourth grade. We do world religions, I think, in 11th grade or so, just because how do you understand California without understanding the religious communities that created it hmm. and then the religious communities that, that, that shaped it? And so this is what we try to do, the academic study of religion. And for us, like I said, we're not an activist organization. We're not a social justice organization. Mm -hmm. We don't make a lot of statements. Where we make our statements is precisely around the scholarly study of religion, the public understanding of religion, and free inquiry thereof. Mm -hmm. And that's as much the key to signing on to this statement the ACLS did out about New College, because you're limiting that free inquiry. You're saying we're not going to have the full range of inquiry. We're just going to look at the, this variable or that variable from this perspective, not in that kind of way. And, and I think that's really the problem. Dr. Amir Hussein, professor and president of the American Academy of Religion, thank you so much for taking the time today. I'd like to be with you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Religica.org podcast at Seattle University. For updates on educational events, resources, or opportunities, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Religica or visit our website at seattleu.edu forward slash the center.